Hey guys, welcome to today's episode of the Owl Empire podcast. It's your host, Adam, and today we are sitting down with my boy, Samir Shabain. A little background about him. He has grown and developed a seven-figure empire on Shopify dropshipping, and there's a lot of valuable insight that was shared by him and some crazy stories that he's gone through, so I highly recommend you guys to pull out a notebook and get some notes written down while you listen. And without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy. Samir, thank you so much for being on the show, my man. Absolutely. So uh, let's get started. So why don't you like bring me back to like the Samir before all of this started? Who 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 were you? Who you were as a person before you know your entire journey behind the business you built started, and how everything changed into becoming to what it is today? Yeah, absolutely, man. First of all, thank you so much for having me on here as well. Uh, I know you guys have a good amount of uh segments under your belt a good amount of attention so i appreciate you guys giving me uh the platform as well to kind of share my story and and my journey here uh although i'm a long long or, or should i say a far far away from being exactly where you know i want to be um i definitely do feel like i am making good progress towards it um you know as opposed to where i was you know a year two three years ago so um, I'll just be, you know, sharing exactly what, um, you know, I've learned what I'm going through and hopefully that will impact and inspire anybody that's listening to this right now, uh, to, you know, keep going no matter where you are at right now. Uh, but to answer your question, Adam, I have been, or should I say, uh, last summer, let's actually do two summers ago because that, that's, that was when the major shift happened. Okay. Um, Two summers ago, I was in San Diego, and I might be getting it mixed up, though. It might have been actually last summer. Time moves too quick nowadays, but uh, uh, last, so that summer when everything changed, man, I was in San Diego. Uh, I had been doing door-to-door sales for about uh, two years or so. I started off in Boston. Um, I went through like two companies or so, and then I came to... San Francisco in California for um, my third company. Like I was actually part of a startup and you know this obviously, the only thing that keeps businesses afloat is sales. So that's all we did, man, is go door to door, um, you know, pitch homeowners on going green um, and, you know, getting some solar systems on their homes. And so, you know, I did that for like about a year and a half and, you know, slowly but surely, man, just got sick and tired of uh, getting door slammed in my face, getting kicked out of houses, getting the cops called on us all the time. And when we were just trying to make an honest living. Cops and why, why is that? I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, you're, it's door to door sales, man. You know, people are sketched out, you know, you're just walking up to their house telling them, hey, I can, you know, save you X, Y, and Z. And, uh, you know, some people are just paranoid, um, you know, in general, man, they don't like strangers. So, uh-huh. um, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, and sometimes we do get a little bit aggressive, you know, cause we believed in, in what we were doing so hard, you know? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, yeah, then we were down in San Diego hoping to launch off like, uh, a new office for the company. And we started looking into uh, drop shipping. Actually, Juan, my, my business partner, who's not here right now, uh-huh. uh, he started looking into drop shipping. And I have always had this obsession with making money online. And we can go into a little bit of detail about that. But um, yeah, he, he just kind of was like, hey, dude, like I got a store going. And I'm like, hold on one second. Like, I want to be part of this because all I've been doing for the past three four years is uh, being aware of and and being a student overall of how to make money online. So So, your business partner already had an existing like Shopify business going? Not not necessarily. I want to call it a business. I would call it like uh, a template. Like he just had a store whipped up. You know what I mean? Like he just uh, set up a store. He hadn't launched any ads yet or anything like that. And that's kind of like, you know, where I came in and I was like, dude, you know, we could totally do this together and make this happen together. Okay, I see. Yeah. And so, like, you were talking about you being a student, and actually, you know, let's let's go back about the whole door, the door to door sales. So, I mean, I know you said you didn't really like it, and it's just a lot of you know things like crazy things happen. But what's like the one big experience you like? One big lesson you took out of you know going out there 
you know, just knocking on doors. Because I'm sure many of like people out there, like people who may be listening to this, are too afraid to even take a step outside their own door and you know go talk to people, network out with people. So, like, wouldn't you say that probably helped you develop this mindset where you just gotta talk to anybody that's in your way so you can just get things going for yourself? Yeah, um, that's a good question, man. I would say the first thing that I learned is uh, doing the things that I don't like to do. Right, like nobody really. It, even if you are making a lot of money, even if you are a manager, whatever it may be, nobody really likes getting up and going out there and knocking on doors and getting rejected. Uh, but if you can learn to do the things that you don't necessarily like, then you can do the things that you love. You know, I think whenever you're doing something that you love or you like or whatever it is, there's, it always comes with things that you do not like doing, that you hate doing. You know, mm -hmm. so even for example, like when you have an e-commerce business, you know, there's things that you do not like doing. Um, but that's what door to door sales taught me. And I would say that's the first thing, at least the second thing is just understanding that behind every sale is an actual human being. Right. So like, for example, when I feel like one of the reasons why we are able to, uh, you know, make a a good amount of money with our e-commerce businesses is because we can understand the fact that there is a human on the other side of that sale like that has to buy the products that we're promoting so how, how so, do you how do you reflect that with like your business does it like because you know it's an online presence so it's not like you're actually speaking to the person yeah you're not you're not exactly so so that's the thing that that i want to uh clarify is like although you're not speaking to the person right there is a human behind you know uh the other side of that phone or the other side of that screen right that's watching it like you're not talking to your your phone or your computer or whatever it is right there's somebody on the other side that has a problem that needs a solution that has needs that has wants and you have to be able to speak to them directly except in door-to-door -door sales you get to you know look them in the eye and you know communicate to them right Mm -hmm. As opposed to when you're on a screen, you're running some Facebook ads, some, you know, some Instagram, Google PPC or whatever it is, sending out an email, you can easily be fooled to think like, hey, I could just, you know, all I'm doing is typing out an email. All I'm doing is uh, recording a video or making an ad, right? But mm -hmm. with the experience of door-to-door -door sales, I'm able to keep in mind that, hey, who is the ex exact person that I'm targeting? Right? Who is the exact customer that I'm trying to serve here? And what problems do they have? You know, what age are they, et cetera, et cetera. And I keep all that in perspective, you know? Uh-huh. All right. That's 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 great. So why don't you like let, let's go let's go back to like more before you even did the door to door sales. Like have you had this hustle mentality ever since you were a kid? Or did this kind of develop as you were growing up or were you kind were you kind of pushed to do it? Like how did it all begin? That's, that's a good question, man. So I would say, uh, honestly, I, I mean, I come from, I, I talked to you about this uh, over text, but, you know, I came from Algeria, right? So most people don't even know what that is. That's in North Africa mm -hmm. um, and, you know, third world country. And we come over to the United States, right? My dad literally dropped everything he had going. Uh, my mother also sacrificed everything they had going. And, you know, against all odds of, uh, their brothers and sisters telling them that they're making a huge mistake for X, Y, and Z reasons. They knew that by bringing me and my older siblings to America, we would be able to take advantage of, you know, more opportunities, get a better education, a better life, uh, you know, all around. And so you were born in Algeria? Yeah, I was born there and I came here when I was like nine years old. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, coming to America, man, I remember the first day that I touched down, there was snow on the ground. Uh, it was super cold. I had never, ever been that cold before. But, you know, I was looking at the city. Like, we were driving under the tunnel. The, I'm not sure if you've ever been to Boston, but uh -uh, no. driving under the tunnel. And then you come up and you get to see the whole city. And I was like, wow. Like, this is literally the dream right here. Like, I have to do whatever it takes to be able to you know, make my parents proud to make them realize that that sacrifice they made uh, was well worth it. So I would so say growing is, up, this is your nine year old self. I yeah, think. this is my nine year old self, man. Yeah. Wow. And, wow. Okay. You know, I, I would look I would look at 
um, you know, my, my parents, the way they kind of moved, the way they thought, and, you know, the way they, they uh, really just kind of went about handling finances, I never really kind of like asked for, you know, allowances or whatever it is. I would always just look for little opportunities um, where I can make a quick profit, right? So I'll give you an example. And I'm sure you have a similar story, but when I was in uh, middle school, I'll never forget lead pencils, you know, the mechanical pencils came out and, you know, kids in my class were going crazy over them, man. Like for mm -hmm. whatever reason, they were going <laughs> insane. And so I'm looking around and I'm like, hold on, hold on one second. These kids are, have a huge demand, right, for these lead pencils and there isn't enough supply. So I would be the kid uh, in class where if somebody asked me for a pencil, I'm not just handing over a pencil. I'm saying, hey, dude, you got $2 for this one right here? This one right here, you know, the 0.7 lead or whatever it is called, you know, this one goes for five bucks. Mm -hmm. And the ones with the twister erasers, I'm not sure if you remember those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I would make a quick profit <laughs> off that as well. And how old were you um, at this time? I would say I was probably like 12 years old or so. 12, okay. Yeah. But then I realized, man, I wasn't making really, uh, like, I, I remember I used to have, like, uh, 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 like my drawer, right, where I would collect all the money that I was making. I would take it all out at the end of, like, the month or whatever, and it would be, like, so many dollar bills. <laughs> like, wow, this is insane. But then one day my, my buddy told me about – um how he goes uh, door to door when it snows and he charges homeowners to shovel their snow. And I'm like, dude, how much are they paying for that? And he goes, oh man, it all depends on what you're doing, you know, where you can convince them to let you shovel, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, I want in on this one. My, my buddy's name was Kevin, he was Vietnamese, uh, one of my best friends uh, in, in middle school. And um, yeah, we would go door to door when it snows out there, like the blizzards would get ridiculous. Um, and you know, while other people were complaining about the snow, I'm like, dude, I pick up my shovel first. My parents would make me shovel, shovel, you know, our house. And then I would start going around the neighborhood, just doing rounds. Hey, knock, knock. Like, do you want me to shovel your, do you want me to shovel your snow? I could do this X, Y, and Z for this much. Uh, you know, barter with them a little bit. Um, and that was, that was always my mentality, man. Like to, to be honest, like I always, you know, I always, always wanted to go directly to the source and, uh, you know, solve a problem. Like nobody really likes going out and shoveling snow. Yeah. Uh, especially but, but, like as a 12 year old, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially as a 12 year old. Right. But <laughs> about the older people, I'm like, dude, they got money, man. Like they got money. And if I find there, they see me young and, you know, hungry and like ambitious, they'll probably give me some, some good money for it. So I remember one day though, I went so hard in the paint that literally I thought my feet, like I was about to catch like some serious pneumonia or something and I crawled over to like my my uh, my uncle's house which was right down the street mm -hmm. and I took cover in there and warmed up a little bit. So this is where kind of like your mentality of just going door to door developed from, huh? wouldn't you say that? So like, let's like, tell, take me back to the moment where like you, op you knocked on your first door, you know, like. I'm really curious about that. So how, how, what kind of emotions were going through and what kind of like, you know, responses did you get as a 12 year old? Like, Hey, I'm here to shovel your snow. I mean, I'm sure most of the, most of the people were just like, Oh, cute, all this kind of stuff. But when you ask yeah. for money, this whole cute just changes, you know, it's like, Oh, this guy's for really serious. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say, I mean, the, the knocking my first door for, uh, for like shoveling snow. I can't remember exactly, man, but what I will say is that, um, there was people that were trying to get me for my services. You know, they'd be like, oh, $25 to shovel the whole thing. And I would have to take a charge and really evaluate the value that I was bringing. I'm like, lady, you're, you're like 70, 80 years old. You can't even step out here and shovel the sidewalk. So <laughs> I'm over here doing you a service for a hundred dollars. I'm going to clean out your whole yard and you know, your whole driveway, your parking lot, whatever it is. Um, but I'll tell you what, my, my first door for solar, man, I, I'll never forget it. I was, uh, they gave me a location. My manager gave me an exact location to go work at. And, um, I get in my Honda Civic. It was like a 2013, like hybrid. And I got in and I had to like play some serious, like motivational music, 
like, you know, jump up and scream in my car to get energized. And it was like a little bit foggy out. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and give this a try. So do you, uh, do you do that to kind of relieve the anxiety and stress? Yeah, relieve the anxiety, get yourself pumped up. I mean, if you're a fan of Tony Robbins, he says the easiest way to change your state is by, you know, your, your changing like your physical state, right? So just like clapping, yelling, jumping, whatever it is. Like affirmations, uh, you know, towards yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I was, uh, and I still am pretty huge on those, but. You know, when I was first getting started, I was taking it super seriously. Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm driving. It was like a 45-hour drive. And mind you that uh, my AC in my Civic does not really work or my heater does not really work. So I'm like half freezing. Um, <laughs> and my wheels start shaking after like 55 miles per hour. So right, I'm like kind of cold. My car is shaking. I'm driving real far, like just to get to the place where they assigned me to. And I sit in my car. I'm like, dude, you can do this. I can feel my palms starting to sweat, butterflies. Uh, and I'm like, dude, how bad can this be, right? So I get out. I go to the first house. I knock on it. And I got my clipboard handy. I got all my pamphlets, blah, blah, blah. Dude, this lady opens the door, man. She was like in her nightgown or whatever it is. And <laughs> she just looked like a mean lady. You know what I'm saying? She just looked like this mean old lady. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. So <laughs> I like try to blurt something out. And she goes right off the bat, I'm not interested. And just slams the door in my face, man. And it felt like I got punched in the gut. I'm like, wow, this is enough for the day. So I convinced myself to hop back in the car. Uh, and just drive back home, and I'm like, that is that is enough for today. <laughs> 45 minutes just to get rejected in the face. 45 minutes, man, for one big blow. Um, and yeah, man, I just drove home. I said, hey, it's cloudy. It's probably you know people are in a bad mood anyway. It's like 1:30. You know, it's people aren't even home yet. Blah blah blah. You know, I sold myself on good excuses. Mm -hmm. So I went back home and, and called it a day, man. I reevaluated everything I was doing. So like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening might have like, you know, parents that either push them to do a lot of things or parents that don't or parents that completely, you know, neglect them. So, I mean, growing up, were your parents more supportive? Like, did your parents ever tell you, hey, Simon, you have to go out there and get money because we need it? Or did that like kind of just... Uh, grow from from like you did that start from the inside of you because you saw how your parents and the hardships they went through i would say a, a i would say definitely the the second one uh where you know i saw my parents going through you know just life in general right and as kids man like we can you know 100 percent understand and you know really feel what our parents are going through right when we see them bickering about you know, a couple dollars or, or rent or whatever it is. But ultimately, man, I mean, my parents are uh, super grateful people. Like they are never the type to complain about what they don't have. Um, so they've always done a little bit of the opposite for me. Where they're like, hey, you don't need to go out there. Like you're, you know, you have what you need. Like you have a room, you have clothes, you have shoes. What do you need extra money for, you know? Mm hmm um, but that, that is, that has some danger to it, you know, because there is a lot of kids that, you know, kind of buy that a hundred percent and say, you know, use it as an excuse to not really become great, you know, to not really fulfill their, their full potential. So I would agree with them. I'd be like, yeah, I definitely do have what I need, but I also want some cool shoes that I don't have to beg you for. So I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna go shovel some doors. Um, you know, or, or shovel some houses. So it, it's definitely a combination of, um, you know, them letting me experiment and allowing me to, uh, you know, fail forward and just kind of put myself in uncomfortable situations. Um, and at the same time, you know, also letting me know that, Hey, um, you know, like, you don't need to be super rich for us to love you or whatever it is. I see. I see. Okay. So like, I, I, I hear this a lot from a lot of people where, you know, like 
how do you get the motivation? How do you get the dedication to do what you want to do? Like, I'm so lazy. I don't want to start this. I don't want to do that. I know I can, but, you know, I don't need to right now. So, I mean, and I'm sure you've heard. I mean, you're a fan of Tony Robbins. All those gurus out there, they talk about how, like, motivation doesn't come knocking on the door. You got to have to seek it. So you being the way you were at a younger age and today growing the business you currently have, what would you say you kind of got you on that momentum and developed that motivation for you on like every single day? What gets you up? Is there something that in your head that every time you have like a moment where you don't want to do something that tells you, no, Simon, you have to, it pushes you? Yeah, I, I would say that Grant Cardone, honestly, man, he, he said it the best. He said, and I hope I can, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, go ahead, bro. <laughs> he said it best, man. He said, just don't be a little bitch. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's so many people out there, man, that, just literally all they do is whine and complain and, uh, you know, just, just literally whine and complain about the most unnecessary things possible. Like, it's like, what are you complaining about? Are you complaining about the fact that you have such a great opportunity in front of you that you're too lazy to, you know, go and take advantage of it? Um, that's one. And the second thing I would say is that motivation, right? motivation comes from action so i remember in my door this is when i learned that this is a hundred percent facts in my door-to-door -door sales career whenever i would go hard for a period of time right so you know like i'll do like a couple weeks or a couple months where i'm just going all out like every single day monday through sunday i'm knocking on doors i'm talking to homeowners i'm making uh contacts and making touches um, and as soon as the money kind of starts to roll in a little bit, like I started to reap the rewards, I, I, every now and then I would take off, uh, take my foot off the, the gas, right? So I'd be like, okay, now I can kind of, you know, enjoy this a little bit, right? Like mm -hmm. I got deals coming in. I'll just go for the appointments that I got. I don't have to go cold approaching. And whenever that would happen, whenever I let my foot off the gas, I noticed my motivation starts to drop. It would be, as soon as I take one day off, it'll be hard for me to go out there again the next day. If I take two days off, it becomes even harder. A week becomes even harder. One month, it's going to be like pushing like a 16-wheeler truck down the street, you for, know, because you lose all momentum. From, yeah. yeah, you got to start from all the way from the beginning. And so that's that's what I keep in mind every single day. So even if, even if, you don't want to do a lot today, all right? Like, hey, I've been working six days out of the week. The seventh day here, I don't. I want to take the day off. I usually never ever do nothing during one day. If that if that makes sense, like I never go a day without doing some type of work where I feel like, hey, I made some progress today. Because if that happens, then I know that the next day it's going to be even harder for me to get back and going at it. Um, so what kind of work do you do? Like, what, what would you recommend for people to do on their days off? I mean, it, it, it all depends on what business you, you got going, right? So, um, is it focused like, on your business or is it more like personal development? Like, like, you know, I know, I know a lot of people that, you know, on their days off, they read books or they do something to make themselves feel accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. I would say a, a little bit of both that definitely can be a uh, part of it. Um, I prefer to do something in my business, whether it be just optimizing some ads, whether it be just, uh, you know, talking to my virtual assistants, like literally whatever it is that I feel like, hey, I have moved the needle today, like just moving the needle a little bit, you know, just dialing something in makes me, gives me that feeling of accomplishment. What, and, and, you know, sometimes it could be just reading a book, right? If I go to the beach and I bring a book with me, and I'm taking notes, I'm like, you know what? I learned some things that I'm gonna be able to implement this week. So I feel like I have made progress. All right, I see. All right, so let's go back to now you are talking previously about your partner and him having a template with the business. So now this is where it all kind of struck for you, all begun. Take us like through kind of like a short step by step on how things started, you know, how you like you finally got into the Shopify business, the kind of mistakes you had to go through and learn and how you felt throughout the whole process. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I mean, this is probably, um, you know, my 
favorite topic to talk about because um, I feel like there's a lot of people that are waiting for, for this breakthrough, you know, or their breakthrough. Um, and everybody, you know, has multiple breakthroughs throughout their life. But, you know, that first initial one, the, the big one, um, you know, really, really can change a lot for someone. Right. And it definitely changed a lot for us. So uh, kind of set some, some pretext. Uh, a couple of years like while I was doing door to door, like all the money that I would make from my door to door sales career, uh, I would invest it into online courses to learn how to make money online, right? So I've learned everything. I was learning everything from building sales funnels, running ads, uh, you know, how to create, um, you know, like literally anything that I can get my hands on that I could afford with a little, man, a little bit amount of money I was making from door to door sales. I would put it right into it. But I was just waiting for that right opportunity to kind of come across my plate. Like I had one of my buddies, Steven, who uh, found his, you know, his, his business model that he can run with, which was affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he had been making tons and tons of money. I mean, while I was doing door to door, he would send me screenshots of like million dollar months. Okay. And I'm over here like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> that can, you know, that can make a lot of people jealous. But for me, it motivated me because, you know, he had dropped out of college. His parents weren't rich. Like he was, you know, doing it all on his own. He sacrificed a lot to be able to, you know, make something like that happen for himself. So I'm like, dude, if he did it, I can do it too. It's just a matter of, you know, when the stars line up. So I'm, I'm, glad, um, I'm glad you brought that up because... A lot of people I've spoken to have, you know, come up to me and, and said that, yeah, when I see like somebody I know succeed, it doesn't really make me jealous. It just kind of demotivates me because I'm like, oh, like he's so ahead of me. He or she is so ahead of me and I'm all the way here. Like I feel like I'm nothing. I feel like I'm worthless. So what's what's an advice or a tip you'd give out to all the listeners out there like in regards to a mindset shift when it comes to and, things like that? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, that's that's something – you know, I feel like that's something uh, a little bit personal, like deep within, like, because because jealousy is a really, um, it's it's like a really really you know bad emotion to carry, right? Like if you see someone, I had to learn this, like that was part of you know my affirmations and part of you know kind of uh, restructuring, I guess my or reprogramming my mindset. Uh huh. To the point where, you know, if I see someone with a nice car, while some of my buddies would be like, oh, dude, he's a drug dealer. He's probably a scammer. He's probably this, that. I would be like, you know what? That guy worked really hard for it. He put in the work. He deserves it. And if I do the same, I'm going to be able to get the same thing. So I guess it's like, you know, that meme of don't just look at the tip of the iceberg. You got to look below sea level and you'll see all the hardships and things that people have yeah, went through. Yeah. So, so that's all it is, man. It's like when I see my buddy sending me these screenshots, I also keep in mind, okay, what did he have to do? Well, he had to drop out of college and within one day, he made a split second decision after getting an offer from uh, a mentor of his to fly over to Malaysia, right? So he used the rest of his money, flew over to Malaysia, didn't have a place to stay. So his mentor let him stay there at his place on a couch and then he worked for him for free and then he started getting paid a little bit of money, a little bit, a little bit more and then soon enough he quit it all. You know, so so I'm just kind of keeping all that in mind, right? It's like, hey, mm -hmm. like it wasn't rocket science. Like he's not a fucking genius. He's just, you know, making sacrifices, putting in the work um, and, you know, taking advantage of opportunity. So for anybody out there that has that type of mentality, whenever they see somebody else succeed or see uh, somebody else, you know, prospering, all you have to remind yourself is, you know, hey, they went through hardships. It might not be clear as to what those hardships are, but there definitely is. And, and it's so crazy. Like if you guys, for anybody listening, I, I dare you, I dare you, the next person that you see on your Instagram or whatever it is, that you know has the success you're looking for if you simply message them or reach out to them and say hey what was the biggest hardship you had to go through to be able to make this happen for yourself 
I promise you the response that you're going to get will probably blow your mind and will probably make any bullshit excuse or you know complaint that you have make it seem like it, it's minuscule like it doesn't even it doesn't even compare you know like like you won't even know what like how 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 crazy of uh you know sacrifices they made until you ask them until they reveal it you know yeah and like it's it's funny because a lot of people are even too scared to kind of just do that initial step of messaging someone i mean yeah. for everyone that's listening this whole entire interview happened because i shot Sam or DM on Instagram. Hey, what's up? When are you available? And just like that, I mean, a lot of people think of like to these celebrities or people who are successful to be like at a like I feel like they live in like on a different planet, you know, somewhere where they can't be in touch with them. When truth is, especially with social media nowadays, I'm sure you'd agree. It's like it's become so simple to communicate with everybody out there. We're all humans. We all have our struggles. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, one thing that, you know, came to mind while you were talking about this. So growing up, did you have friends that were just always hustlers or like, was, was that something like that just happened because of people you were around or the, or the, like the family members you were around or was that something you had to put yourself into? Well, I would say a uh, big part of it, man, was, was my father. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur or is an entrepreneur. Not, not much anymore, but growing up, you know, he had his own farm. Uh, and I think farming is the prime example of, you know, entrepreneurship, right? That's like probably the first form of entrepreneurship that, you know, our civilization has or human mankind has seen, right? It's like mm -hmm. you take a seed, you put it in the dirt, you take care of it, you know, four seasons later, whatever it is, you, you bear, uh, you know, the, the rewards, right? And so just seeing my father uh, in the farm, you know, working, grinding it out, um, you know, just just watching him, man, just like just make something out of nothing, you know, literally make something out of nothing um, taught me a lot, you know, taught me a tremendous amount. And in terms of my friends in America, uh, when I was able to combine my father's, you know, mindset when it came to farming with my you know, the friends that I hung out with in terms of like how they hustled, how they kind of, you know, uh, like moved and, you know, thought about like business in general. It really, really kind of created something I feel like unique within me that, uh, you know, I'm forever, ever grateful for. Um, and, you know, it's so funny because in high school, like the friends that I would say influenced me the most when it comes to like, when it comes to like entrepreneurship mm -hmm. or, you know, mindset a little bit, um, they, you know, used to wear like really, really dope streetwear, right? Mm -hmm. So they would rock like a lot of streetwear, right? And I'm like, I'm looking at these guys and they're like, you know, doing the absolute most, like they would camp out, they would spend their lunch money on, uh, you know, the coolest shoes. They would always be talking about, you know, like uh, cool clothes and stuff like that and, you know, exclusive releases. And so I started to pay attention and I'm like, okay, well, if they're, if they're that excited over streetwear, then there's probably a tons of other people out there as well. So I'm like, hey, what, why don't I start my own streetwear lifestyle brand? So I actually started one in high school and uh, it was called Stiz Lifestyle. Don't ask me what the name means because I've yet to figure it out. <laughs> um, but I, I would say it was just, it stands for Style with Ease. And I would literally, I would make, you know, I'd make people custom t-shirts, whatever they want at first. Then I created a brand out of it. Uh, and then I stopped making custom t-shirts and only selling my brand. And I would literally be slinging them in high school. You know, I'll be slinging them like in hallways. I would take the bus to go meet kids from other high schools around the city where I lived at uh, to sell them. Sometimes kids would pull up to my high school. And all those friends that I was telling you about initially would tell me like, hey, like these are the brands right here that everybody looks up to. You should make, you know, model after what they're designing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they kind of gave me that idea of like modeling and, um, you know, following what works in terms mm -hmm. of streetwear, but I carry that same exact mindset throughout everything else that I've done. Okay, so now, so 
you so we we went through this the door to door sales. Now we're talking about you building this brand. So take me through how you took all that you've learned in your past and applied it to your Shopify businesses, and like talk about that and and tell us about how it all how it, how it happened and how it was built and how it grew to become what it is today. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I would say the biggest thing that I've learned. Um, or the biggest thing that I kept in mind when first launching the Shopify business is that Rome was not built in a day. So right off the bat, I was able to relate to, I'm like, hey, if it took me a couple months to get my door-to-door -door sales pitch right, then I definitely shouldn't expect the first you know, product that we launch or uh, the first offer that we launch to be an, uh, you know, an automatic hit. And also at the same time, kind of to take it back to modeling, um, you know, I would model my managers, right? The way they pitched, the way that they sold, the way that they presented and closed in door-to-door -door sales. I'm like, hey, like, let's not reinvent the wheel here when it comes to uh, building an e-commerce business. Let's simply model what's already working. Mm -hmm. So one day we were going door-to-door -door and, um, you know, Usually on slow days, we just be on our phones like through, you know, as we're moving from door to door. And I come through this article and it was super sunny out, like it was beating. Uh, and I, was, I saw this article and like we, I stopped Juan and I'm like, dude, look at this article. Two kids make an absolute killing, uh, you know, drop shipping like fidget spinners online. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, what the hell are these fidget spinners? You know, most people think of them as little toys. But then I realized that the truth behind those fidget spinners was not just because it was a cool toy. It was because it solved a problem, a really big problem, right? ADHD. Yeah. Right? So people who had a chronic, um, and, and I'm no scientist or doctor, so uh, my apologies if I don't describe it right. But it is a serious mental, you know, problem, right? Definitely. Yes. And so these kids are, are selling where these guys are selling, you know, fidget spinners and solving and helping a lot of people with a serious problem. And that's why they were able to make a killing. And so I'm like, hey, if we can find a similar product, right? Because at first we were just trying to sell whatever we liked, whatever we wanted to sell, uh, whatever we thought was, you know, cool or whatever we can relate to. But we quickly realized that it is not about what you like, okay? This is the first thing that anybody that wants to build an, a business in general, a business in general. It is not about what you like, okay? We live in such an egotistical world and such a narcissistic world that the first thing someone asks them, ask themselves when they're trying to start a business is, hey, like, what am I good at? Like, what do I want to sell? What do I want to offer? It's not about you, right? Because it's about the marketplace. It's about what other people are willing to buy, what other people like, what other uh, people have problems with what other solutions they're looking for. And so after failing with the first couple of products we tried to launch, um, we started to ask ourselves that question a lot and we just started modeling exactly what other successful e-commerce businesses was doing. And that was everything from, you know, the marketing aspect, the way they structured their Facebook ads, their funnels, uh, their, their, you know, Shopify stores in general, the email marketing, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and simply by modeling, you don't have to recreate the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you get to cut out like 90% of your learning curve. And so it's, it's uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing, man, when, when you kind of accept the fact that it's not about you, it's not about recreating the wheel, and it's not about... Um, you know, and it's not, it's not about having to create a brand new opportunity, it's simply taking advantage of all the opportunities or just one opportunity that's, you know, around you. So how long did it take you to succeed and like what, like how many products did you have to release and how many times did you have to try until finally something hit? Honestly, Adam, I don't really remember the exact um, number, but what I will say is that that's not what we were focused on because we knew that if we could just find one good product, right, it would make up for all of the failed experiments before. Like just one, and it was, and it held true. Just one product makes up for a major, major amount of failed experiments, you know, that, that you launched before. 
one one thing that I want to add to beforehand uh, to the question before is skill sets. Mm -hmm. I think that at the core, and I literally just recorded a podcast, uh, and I'm going to shamelessly plug my podcast in here. I hope you don't mind. Go ahead, man. All right. So in my recent podcast, uh, for it's called the Secure the Bag podcast. Secure the Bag podcast. It's available almost every platform. Uh, but I just recorded an episode yesterday where I was talking about at the core of every success is skill sets, right? So if you look at any single athlete, any single entrepreneur, uh, you know, leader, there was a skill set that they mastered. And I think a lot of people, for example, when it comes to e-commerce, all they can think about is that product. Mm -hmm. When in reality, you can, I can give you a list of tons of products. And as a matter of fact, we literally give our students a list of products every single week. So you but said, we, um, so, you, so, so you currently like you, you mentor people, you coach people, or you have like a program? Yeah. Yeah, we have we have uh, some students that we mentor personally. Uh -huh. um, we don't do it to like everybody for the most part. We like to kind of pick and choose who we work with. Okay. Um, but we we give them the list of products, right? And we say, hey, look, this list of products is gold. But in order for you to take advantage of it, you have to learn the skill sets to be able to, you know, deliver these products to the right people, put them in front of the right people convince them to exchange their hard-earned money for your product. And so for anybody out there listening, if you're thinking about starting an e-commerce business, I'm telling you right now that it is not about how beautiful your store looks, although that does play a part in it, don't get me wrong. It's not about, you know, uh, simply about your product. It all comes down to the skill sets, to take advantage of the opportunity that is in front of you. I think there is no such thing as a lack of opportunity in our world right now, Adam. I think it's only a lack of people that lack skill sets. A lack of people with the skill sets to be able to take full advantage of those opportunities. Beautiful. That's, beautiful. that's literally what it comes down to, man. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you know, like, so uh, we're, we're cutting it close to the time now, so I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah. But before I do, I actually have a question. You stated that you know you weren't focused on the product more so like the skill sets of things. So now let's let's talk about money for a second. Since your 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 podcast is called Secure the Bag Podcast, so yeah, <laughs> you seem like a money guru. <laughs> so were you were you all about the money? Were you all about chasing the money, or did you really care about like the service you're providing for the people, the people you were providing it to? Because in the beginning of the podcast, you did speak about how even behind the screens, there's someone buying your product. Yeah. And I'm sure many of many entrepreneurs out there make the mistake of like in the beginning just wanting the money and that's all they really care about. So what what's your what's your take on that? Um I would say that that's a really good one man. You got tons of good uh questions here. I would say Thank you, man. it definitely does come down to the money man because you know if if you're not making money it means that you're not helping out enough people. So it is it is definitely about the money. But you also have to keep in mind that your customers, right? They, you, you have to be able to have your customer's best interest at heart, right? But at the same time, though, you also have to keep in mind that, hey, if you want to live life on your own terms, if you want to, uh, you know, feed your family, keep a roof over your head, you know, keep your office going, pay your employees or whatever, it does come down to the money. And there's, and there's tons, I feel like there's tons of uh, entrepreneurs, and this is why I love Grant Cardone so much is because he has been able to, you know, break this false belief within me that, you know, making too much money is, is not necessarily a good thing. Um, you have to keep in mind that, hey, yes, I have to help people out and give, right, and, you know, give, 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 then get. But at the same time, and like making money, there is absolutely nothing wrong with making money. Like if you sell somebody, if you don't sell somebody that thing that can solve their problem and you give it to them for free, they're still going to turn around and buy it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because whenever somebody, like if you have a solution for someone, right? If you have a real solution for someone, if you give it to them for free, they will not appreciate it. They will not value it. Like for example, my YouTube channel, I have tons 
and tons of tutorials on how to start your own e-commerce business, your own uh, drop shipping business. But guess what? People do not treat it as if they paid for it. So they overlook it. And I'm telling you right now, I literally do not know how to beat around the bush. Like I just don't know how to be, I, I just focus on telling them exactly what the deal is. Like I don't focus on, you know, oh, like some other, you know, gurus out there like, oh, I'm just going to tell them a little bit and sell them the rest. Like I just, whenever I record it, a video on my YouTube, I go all out. Like I just keep it real. Yeah, I keep it real. I tell people exactly what the deal is. Um, and, but at the same time though, most people will not value it as if they paid for it. So that's like the most interesting thing to me, man, is like, it's an interesting concept, don't you say? It is, it is, it is. It definitely is because yes, you don't want to be, you don't want to be super focused on the money. I think there has to be a balance because every single time, uh, in my life where I have Stop focusing on serving the customer and giving value and providing education, uh, you know, educating a customer before I ask them for a sale and just focus on the money. I sense, I start to feel this sense of like greed, this sense of, uh, you know, like I'm not really serving my customers or my audience or my list. And so there has to be a balance. Like you have to be providing education you have to be providing value you have to be building relationships but at the same time though you have to be selling as well people want to buy stuff man like that's one thing i realized in door-to-door -door sales is people love buying stuff like especially when they get paid man when they get paid <laughs> they want to buy something why because they worked so hard for that money that now they want to buy something that helps them in some sort of way so there's nothing wrong with being money focused, but you also have to have a balance of uh, a service mentality as well. Sweet, sweet. So for everyone that's listening out there, whoever's interested in opening an e-commerce business, is there anything, is there any way they can like, you know, learn from you or maybe the content you produce? Want to, like, you know, if you'd like to talk about that, because there's definitely some things that, you know, I know we're out of time now, so I'm not going to get into it, but there's a lot of questions that popped up in my head when you're talking about resonating the message to the customers, you know, all through a screen. So I definitely think that's a skill set to learn. So uh, how how can somebody learn that skill set from someone like you? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I would say the best place is to follow me on Instagram. It's going to be S-A-M-I-R, Samir dot C-H-I-B as in Bob, A. N as in Nancy, E as in Edward, Samir dot Shabane on Instagram. And that is where I post up daily content and I link you to my YouTube as well. You can look me up on YouTube by my full name. Um, but yeah, those will probably be my two main hubs right there. And I'll, I, I put out tons of content, everything that I'm learning, doing, that's working for me, not working for me, I share it as well. All right, so now for our final golden question uh, i like to keep this one and um you know make it deep so my question for you for everyone that's listening out there what would you advise them on how to find their passion how to find their passion that's a good one man i would say that's it's definitely not easy to answer how to find your passion <laughs> i would say it's something it's something man usually passion is something that you can talk about for hours without feeling like without even noticing it like you you can talk about it on a saturday night like this is how gary v describes it is you can focus like you you can be hanging out with your buddies on a saturday night talking about this one topic and you don't even feel like you're spending time on it like it becomes so effortless like you might watch tons of content on it on youtube um but at the same time man like I think I think there's a this might sound a little bit twisted, but I think there's there's more money to be made in turning other people's passion into a profit. Huh, wow. So I think there's more money to be made, right? And like if we're talking about making money here, like if, if we're talking about passion, you know, feeling living a fulfilled life, like I am not the it's one here. Bag, bro. Yeah, like I'm I'm only twenty three years old, man, so I'm still figuring out this whole thing called life. <laughs> um, you know, so I'm not like a Tony Robbins type of dude, but yeah, yeah. 
you know, like that's something you're gonna have to talk to him about. But what I will say is that if you can find what other people are passionate about and you provide them with the products or the offer to either fulfill that passion uh, or fulfill the, the problems they have with that passion, you can make a shit ton of money. Like, like there's no tomorrow. Turn their passion into profit. There you go, man. That's our program right there. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Yes, sir. All right, Simon. Well, thank you so much, man, for you know being on the show. I appreciate all the value you've provided. Definitely some valuable information. Uh, thank you for your time. Hey, Adam. Thank you so much for having me on the Owl Empire here, man. I am super, super um, grateful that you gave me the chance on here to share my message, share my story, and my uh, do's and don'ts with your audience. Thank you guys so much for listening in and tuning in. And I hope you guys learned a lot from all the crazy stories Samir had to go through to be able to develop the the huge empire he currently has on Shopify. And without further ado, I hope this inspired you to take action immediately on your dreams and to keep things going for yourself no matter how hard it gets. You know, from listening to Samir's background, I'm sure now you guys understand that things don't come easy and everything in life always comes with hard work and effort put in to your dreams. And without further ado, I encourage you guys to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Leave a review to the show. You know, it definitely helps us thrive for the upcoming episodes. We got some amazing guests going to be coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. This is your host, Adam, signing out, and I'll see you guys later.